Hello, hello everyone. This is Ali Azuddin from Fourth Generation for Education. We're live on Facebook. We're live here on Zoom. And then I'm so happy to have Magdalena with me for this afternoon session, the start of our afternoon session. Uh, so Magdalena, we have people watching from Australia, Portugal, Qatar, Spain, UAE, Lebanon, and then many other places like Indonesia, Saudi Arabia. Hello, Carmen. Carmen was attending a workshop last weekend with me, and then she's here again. Uh, okay. This is great. I can see many familiar faces. Hello, Rachel. And uh, let's give it a start. Let's know more about Magdalena, uh, who describes herself as a third culture kid. And uh, let's give it a start. Okay, amazing. So we're a really international crowd here today, yes. um, which makes me feel right at home. Uh, so a little bit about myself. My name is Magdalena Krohn. I was born in Poland. I live in Italy and I work in Switzerland. I've been an international teacher for 10 years. I was educated in the IB program uh, in international schools around the world. And I now teach the PYP, MYP and diploma programs in international schools. Uh, so that's just me in a nutshell. And I'll be talking to you today about how you can cater to third culture kids such as myself uh, uh, as a teacher. All right, so let's begin by uh, just a little survey that you can, um, you can answer. So when people ask you where you are from, what do you say? What do you normally say? A very interesting question to start with. So for all the people who are watching on Facebook or here on Zoom, when people ask you, where are you from? What do you say? Let us read your answers in the chat or on, on Facebook. So giving them a few seconds to type and to put sure. uh, the answers. Yes, we started the English sessions. So for the people who are asking, is it an Arabic session? No, now all the Arabic sessions are done. We had them in the morning. And now checking the people, what do they say when you ask them where they are from? They say Spain, UK, Mumbai, India, from Morocco, um, I was born in England, but I lived in separate six different countries, uh -huh. Nigeria, I'm Australian, and my passport country is from the UK, but <laughs> I'm not sure if there is a but. Uh, I'm American, but I have lived in Egypt uh, in, and in Saudi, back to US and then back to Saudi. Usually I say Egypt. Uh, so let me say hello to Aleka. Aleka, what do you say when people ask you where you are from? Aleka is watching on Facebook. Uh, voilà. So you see, we, we got very different answers. Mm -hmm. People just giving uh, the nationality and people mentioning a little bit more about where they live. And, uh, and, and, and then Aleka, she's saying, I'm not a third culture kid, but my kids are. So this session is for you. Um, yeah. Some people are saying Jordan, Filipino in Kuwait. I usually say I'm from Lebanon, living in the UAE. So I connect my origin to where I'm living right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. So yeah, yeah, huge, a variety of answers. Some, for some people, it's straightforward. For other people, you, you start going into a story or you talk about your passport country, which is not necessarily the country that you fully identify um, as being from. So that's kind of some of the stuff we're gonna be talking about today. So when people ask me, I usually have this reaction. <laughs> I like the five minute family story. <laughs> yeah, it's like, do you want the long story or the short story? Or shall I just tell you something so that you don't ask me any more questions? It really depends on you know, who's asking and, and the way in which they're asking. Um, but yeah, so I love this meme that I came across a, a few years ago and it's always like, what do I say? What kind of answer are you expecting? So this is uh, a lot of third culture kids feel like this and especially as they get older and they start, you, you know, they go off to, to new schools and then to university. Um, 
it's like, why do you want to know where I'm from? <laughs> and, you know, it, it brings up a whole, whole, uh, a whole bunch of different feelings. Okay, so I'm going to start this webinar by telling you a story. So I'm going to launch into storytelling mode for about 10 minutes. Um, and after that, we will talk about, uh, based on my, my story, based on my life, based on my experience as a third culture kid, uh, we'll talk about um, how teachers can cater to third culture kids in uh, primary school, in middle school, and then high school and university transitions. So, Ali, if it's okay with you, I'll start. Yes, and then uh, just to uh, wrap up all the, the, the answers about uh, where you are from, I would say hello to Raja, who answered, I'm from everywhere. <laughs> Love it. Love it. So we're ready for the story, a story time. I love stories, by the way. So let's hear your, your story and then we continue. Well, I always thought that my biggest problem as a third culture kid uh, was people asking me where I'm from all the time and not being able to give them a straight answer. It turns out that it's not. The biggest problem of being a third culture kid is thinking that the world is smaller than it is. But can you blame me? Growing up, the only words of comfort I got from people whenever I had to move change schools, leave friends behind, were stuff like, it's a small world, we're all connected, you have the internet, you have Skype, you'll see each other again very soon. Um, and these, these were all things from well-meaning people. Um, you know, the truth about third culture kid friendships is that you probably won't see each other again. I mean, if you're lucky, you will, but often you make promises you can't keep because it's so hard to say goodbye and to part with people who have become dear to you. Um, but what you end up doing every time you start in a new school, you see it as an opportunity to start fresh and reinvent yourself. You go to a place where nobody knows you, the slate is clean, and you, you start to think about your identity and, and any changes that you wanna make to, to who you are in a completely new environment. So it feels very empowering, but it's also a little destabilizing because you're changing all the time. It creates this illusion that it's easy to be whoever you wanna be. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, you can always move and start again somewhere else. And this becomes a part of, of how you think and how you, experience the world is that there's always a fresh start somewhere else. Uh, so the other thing that makes the world seem so small to a third culture kid is having friends from lots of different countries you suddenly become real and within reach. In elementary school, my friend Ricky's parents showed us endless slides of their summer vacations in a place called Stony Brook, Michigan. In my mind, this place became mythical that I dreamed of someday visiting it. Another friend made Sweden feel like I had grown up there, even though I hadn't even been to Sweden at the time. So I hung out at her house all the time, watching Swedish movies, baking gingerbread cookies, uh, until I could practically speak Swedish. And now, whenever I visit Scandinavia, I feel oddly at home. All throughout my school days, friends put their countries on the map for me. Israel, Ukraine, South Korea, Russia, Nigeria, Canada, Malaysia, the list goes on. The world truly felt small and within reach. I felt like I had access to these places, like a key that unlocked the door to culture and belonging in all of them, thanks to my friends. Right, so at this point, maybe you're asking yourself why I said this was a problem. Well, one weird side effect of this kind of life was that I grew up more interested in the world than in my own native culture. In fact, I had zero interest in patriotism of any kind because I had no real roots in Poland. I left when I was six years old. 
Um, so even though my family eventually returned to Poland, I continued going to an American international school. So we continued to live in this expat bubble. Uh, and my sense of belonging in my own country just grew weak in country. Um, the, and this, this discomfort, it felt like, it just felt like something that I didn't want to deal with at the time because I was more interested in, in seeing the world. So I had no real roots in my passport country and, and this discomfort was kind of a, a, just a blip in the back of my mind. Um, in, in high school, conversations among my friends uh, were starting to turn to life after graduation, you know, this next big step for us. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I would go to college in the United States because most of my friends were going. My school was an American curriculum school. So I just kind of felt like that was the, the next logical step and it was gonna happen for me. Uh, and I wanted to go where my friends were going. I had a feeling that I would find the belonging in the United States that I had not found in Poland. I dreamed of the sunny campuses that I saw in the, the college catalogs and the plan in my head was ambitious, but I had convinced myself that it was totally doable. I would apply to the universities of my dreams. I would go there shedding my old skin and become a whole new person. I would reinvent myself and become a character in the next episode of the movie of my life. At, you know, 17, 18 years old, I didn't know who I was or what I really wanted, I mean, who does? I just wanted to get out, go bigger, go further. When I tell people the story, I laugh and I say that post-communist Poland was at the time just too dull, too boring, progress was too slow. You know, I had seen the world um, but the truth is that I never really felt at home in Poland, and this did not sit very well with me, and I wanted to get away from that discomfort. It felt kind of sad, but it wasn't something I wanted to deal with. So it was easier to run away from this feeling and search for some other place where I could fit in. So I started plotting who I would be in college the classes I would take, the societies I would join, the sports I would play. I, I watched this TV show called Felicity. I don't know if, if any of you have ever seen this. Um, Felicity was this show about this girl who goes to university in NYU in, in New York. And so this was really influencing me and I pictured my life like that. Uh, you know, coffee shops, libraries, love, and a little bit of drama. Uh, this was my, my reference point. Um, Oh, and then I would become an actor and direct movies and move to LA, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and write books. Um, or I would become a lawyer. I, I didn't know what I wanted. But my idea of success was based on becoming a different person in a different place. Well, I did not end up going to the United States. Uh, it turned out not to be as easy for me as it was for my American friends. And when I pictured myself all alone somewhere on the other side of the Atlantic without a support network or the option of a cheap flight home, the world suddenly expanded. It hit me for the first time how big it was and how small I was. I went to university in London instead, uh, which wasn't a disappointment or anything. Um, it just was not what I imagined university would be like. My only frame of reference was what I had seen in American movies. And well, it turned out that I'd been watching the wrong movies. I suffered a huge culture shock and I realized what a bubble I had been living in. I wish I could say it, it all turned out fine. It was a happy ending, but I found it pretty hard to find my place, even in a big diverse university in a big diverse city like London. I never found belonging anywhere, despite making a habit of sometimes looking at a map and plotting where I would go next and who I could be there. And I did this a lot. Um, but what did happen was I found a sense of groundedness in this lack of belonging. I found a way to feel at home 
in myself, in my own identity, rather than in a physical place. And this, for me, has been a bigger success than anything material or conventional. I also found my way back to the community where I had always felt at home, the one where I once, the one I once wanted to leave in search of bigger things. That's the international school, and this time as a teacher. My first overseas teaching job was in Lilongwe, Malawi. And there I got to teach the IB diploma, which I had done myself not so long ago. So that was fun. My students were from all over the place. Most of them with mixed up third culture identities like me. One of them was a girl called Maya. And Maya reminded me a lot of myself. She was Malawian and had been at this international school all her life. She spoke with a perfect American accent and her favorite subject was English, as mine had been. She loved literature and poetry and wrote her extended essay on female identity in Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's novel. She had a fire in her belly to do great things. She started applying for scholarships to US universities. I really wanted this for her. I hope that it would all work out. But watching my first cohort of diploma students getting ready to set foot in the real world was also somewhat unsettling for me. I remembered the dream I myself once had, which I dismissed earlier as the naive wishful thinking of a high school senior, but it was at the time a real dream. The thing is, I was happy with my life now, but I suddenly wondered whether there was something else I could have done. I looked back on all the crossroads and wondered if I honestly could have chosen a different path at any one of them. But no, somehow I felt that they would all lead me back to the exact same place I was in now. As for Maya, she did really well on her diploma exams. But she didn't get those scholarships she needed and her family couldn't afford to send her to the United States. She went to university in Mauritius instead. Not her first choice, but not a bad one. She, like me, thought that the only path to success was the one with the big shiny rewards uh, and the big change of identity at the end. The one that would prove to the world what she was capable of. So maybe it felt like a failure not to get that. After university, Maya returned to Malawi with a degree in economics and international relations. I don't know if this was what she wanted or if she came back because she had to, but she became a powerful voice in the community she once dreamed of leaving. She became a women's rights activist and a performance poet, co-founded a nonprofit arts organization, started publishing prize-winning stories in literary magazines, all of which she is still doing. When I compare Maya's story to mine, I think about the way third culture kids construct their understanding of a reality and specifically success. We're exposed to infinite possibilities. We grow up believing that we can go anywhere and be anyone, which can lead to feeling like what we have is not good enough. People talk to us about dreaming big, the sky is the limit. We compare our identities to those of our friends not realizing that despite having the whole third culture kid in common, it's different for each one of us. Each one of us has a unique combination of cultures and experiences and often complex relationships with the places we come from. No one talks to us about starting with what we have, about understanding what belonging and authenticity means to us and how we can use that to forge paths to success that are authentically ours. Okay, well that's the end of my story. And I wonder, having heard that, what you learned about third culture kids that you may not have known before. I, I feel that all the people were sitting like this and listening attentively to all those details and the <laughs> question that you shared at the end. Uh, for me, it was inspiring. Um,
hearing and making those connections, Magdalena. So let's see uh, some of the takeaways from the story. What did you learn about TCKs from the story? Uh, I'm waiting for your responses on Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, so uh, Sarwa, she just said inspiring in the, in the chat. And I remind you that in, just, in the chat, please put to all panelists and attendees if you want everyone to read your responses and your answers. So what are the takeaways from the story? What did you learn about third culture kids? We're waiting for your responses. I think by, 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 by writing also this story, Magdalena, you learn a lot about who you, you are and, and, uh, and yourself. Yeah. So another uh, response, I think people are taking time to, writing, uh, to write like long uh, responses. Interesting wow. to think that success was tied to constructing a new identity in a new place. Mm. So again, so how our definitions and experiences changes um, based on where we are and, and what we are doing. Yeah, so yeah. I was commenting on this idea by, by writing the story, um, how much did you learn about, about who you are? Yeah, well, I, I write a lot. And mm. this isn't the first time that I've written something about my, myself in trying to figure out my own identity. Um, but every time I do write something, it really sheds a new light on, you know, on something I didn't know before. Again, so, getting uh, again. Uh, so you you raised the, the importance of the sense of belonging. Again, it's inspiring, and uh, we made connection to who we are. Continuous search for an identity, but also exposure to other cultures makes you uh, more open-minded, and you accept more the differences. These are some of the ideas and the learning after hearing the story. Great. Uh, some kids living in their our in their our country and feel like they don't belong due to what is happening in their country. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's a very complex issue. Yeah. Good. So I think we're ready for the next step. All right. Okay. Well, so for the rest of this webinar, uh, I am going to be talking about. You know, we'll start off with what are third culture kids. Um, most of you already know, I'm just gonna pop a definition on there. Then we're gonna talk about their experiences in school and higher education. And uh, I'll give you some tips on what you can do as teachers for your TCK students um, in your classroom. And then we'll end with a, a little Q and A. Yes, so I would remind everyone, send all your questions in the Q&A section so I can track them. And I'm sure everyone will be waiting for the uh, part where you are going to give the tips. And we have tips for primary teacher, middle teachers, and high school teachers. So let's, yeah. have, let's start with the definition. Okay. Um, so as you can see here, a diagram and then a, an official definition uh, which is quite a mouthful. Uh, you know, it's an individual who, having spent a significant part of their developmental years in a culture other than their parents' culture, develops a sense of relationship to all the cultures while not having a full ownership in any. So it's like this uh, three-part Venn diagram here. The third culture identity, it's not the combination of, of two cultures. It's it's a very complex mix of, of experiences. Um, you know, a little bit of your parents' culture, a little bit of the host culture, the, the countries that you grew up in. And then you might get this mix of other cultures like I did, you know, the Swedish, the American, uh, from my friends, the, the people that formed the environment in the international school. Um, but just a little side note on, on what a third culture is and, and what it isn't, it's very, it's, it's too complex to actually categorically, categorically say this is, this is and this isn't. Um, I'll give you an example. My sister's husband once asked me, uh, am I a third culture kid? And, and I said, well, how do you feel? Because he is first generation, he's British, he's a British citizen born in the UK, his parents, 
uh, are Jamaican and they, they emigrated from Jamaica to the UK. And he grew up in the north of England all his life. Um, but he doesn't feel like he belongs anywhere. He's got this Jamaican heritage, he's got his English identity, um, but he feels like, and you know, officially, according to this definition, he's never moved around the world. So some might say that he's not a third culture kid. Maybe he's a cross culture kid or, or you know, he's got a separate identity issue because, um, because of his immigrant parents. Um, but the more that I spoke to him, the more he said, well, I really feel like I am a third culture kid. And so, you know, it really depends on the, the individual's story and how they feel about belonging. But okay. So my, my focus of this webinar is going to revolve around the idea of home, belonging, and identity, because these things are uh, fundamental in sort of the well-being of of students, of all students in a classroom and in a school environment. Let's start with elementary school. One thing that I feel is very, very important uh, for younger students, especially those who are highly mobile, those who are crossing between cultures, um, or they've already been in several cultures, um, is to acknowledge and celebrate their mother tongue. Um, and just drawing on my personal experience, when I moved to Saudi Arabia from Poland, I didn't speak a word of English. And I became completely immersed in, I went to an American school, so completely immersed in, in the English language to the point where I started to forget my mother tongue. And I never actually got back to the, the level of fluency of Polish that I had before. And that's left me with almost with this kind of sense of like embarrassment. Like I come from Poland, but I don't speak the language as well as I speak English. And English is not my mother tongue. So it's, it's very confusing. And I, it's, it's in IB schools, if you work in an IB school, they put a lot of emphasis on mother tongue. Um, but if you don't, it's something to think about. Uh, you know, what different mother tongues do you have in your classroom? And how can you get the students to share a little bit about their, the language that they speak at home uh, and bring that into the classroom and share it with the other students so that they don't feel like their language is, is insignificant, it's unimportant, it's being lost because the, you know, the dominant language in the classroom is something else. And so they, they need to learn this new language, which they do, but there's got to be a balance and there's got to be an appreciation of the original language of, of the other language or languages that they speak. And uh, the other thing that's important to do alongside that, it goes very well with the language is celebrate the cultural diversity in your classroom over conformity to the dominant culture, if there is a dominant culture, it really depends on what kind of school it is. But, um, you know, I went to an American international school, but there was a lot of emphasis on American culture over all others. So it was like um, the school was trying to get all these international kids to conform to American culture. And I'm not saying this as like, oh, this was very bad on the part of the school. Um, you know, often parents know what they're signing up for when they put their um, children in an international school and some schools are like this. But within your classroom as an individual teacher, it can create a really beautiful environment and appreciation amongst all the students when you find ways to celebrate the cultural diversity, ask students where they're from, um, find opportunities uh, for them to share with the class uh, where they, you know, where they've come from, where they've been, and what's important to them. And through this, you'll create an inclusive atmosphere where kids don't feel like outsiders. They don't feel like, well, I'm not like the rest of them because everyone's come from one country and I come from, where do I come from? I, 
I lived in Japan, uh, but but my parents are not from Japan. We lived in uh, Malaysia. Oh my goodness, it's, you know. But if you create this inclusion where everyone has some differences and something in, unique to celebrate, it creates an environment that's a little more comfortable uh, for kids who may be a little bit confused about their identity because of all the places they've been to. Okay, I'm gonna move on to talking about middle and high school. And then before you start Magdalena, let me remind them, if you yes. have any question, please send it in the Q&A. And then the question they started coming up, we will be answering them uh, at the, towards the end of the webinar. So I think those also uh, points in the primary um, that you just mentioned are, are very important. I've been working in primary schools. And then we also created an idea where we created a cultural backpacks. And so in the library, those families coming from different countries, they, they offered the library a bag. And then in the back, we had stories fiction one, non-fiction one about the country and then artifacts. And then we kept that journal. And so when the student, they will take those cultural backpack, they can read the story, put their command, put their reflection. And then that's how also you can create a very physical uh, corner at the school to, to show the diversity and to celebrate the diversity. Exactly, yes, that's amazing. See, these mm. are concrete examples that I mm. didn't get into because there are so many. Um, you know, it really comes down to the creativity of the teachers and, in your particular environment. But yeah, the cultural backpack is a beautiful idea, which does exactly this, recognizes. Good. So we can move now for the middle and high with more tips and more ideas from you. Middle and high. Yeah. Okay. So. I mean, some of these things will apply to, to the elementary kids as well. And, and you know, it, it crosses over. Um, but for teenagers, when they move into middle school, it becomes, you know, friendships become very important and, and your identity is forming, you're becoming more aware of yourself and, and your identity and being the odd one out and fitting in. So there's a lot of anxiety that starts to bubble up for teenagers, preteens and, and teens in middle school and high school. Um, and transitions are very important at this time. They are important in, throughout the whole school experience. Um, but I've put this into middle and high school because first of all, this wasn't something that was ever done for me. Some schools are better at this than others. Um, and transitions are more important than we think. Um, so something that you can do at the beginning of the school year is spend time on introductions more than just the, you know, the one off first lesson, like, hi, you know, two truths and one lie. Who are you? Tell us a bit about yourself. And OK, let's move on. Um, but really spend a little bit more time asking about where everyone has come from. Uh, not where are you from, but where have you come from? Where have you just been? Uh, talk a little bit about the culture and give them new coming students, incoming students, give them an opportunity to share with the students who are already there about the culture that they've just come from and uh, an opportunity to talk about the school that they were at before. Um, because I think this can benefit everyone. It can help the new students to feel like they're being seen and recognized uh, and they've not just been dumped into this new environment that they're going to be seen for who they are, for the experiences they've had. But they can also share and educate um, the other students and broaden their horizons and help them to see that there's a bigger, you know, there's a, a world out there. Um, the end of the school year, again, with transitions, emphasize the importance of saying goodbye. And now this might be something done in the classroom. This might be done um, by the school counselor or whoever is responsible for students' well-being. Um, but goodbye is, is a very important thing because often kids that age in, in middle school and high school it starts to become a little traumatic for them, especially if they're very highly mobile and they're moving every two or three years. They sort of close themselves off emotionally. 
Um, and they feel like they don't have to say goodbye because they've done this so many times. Um, goodbye really makes no difference. But actually, it's important to take a moment to, it's like a mindful moment to acknowledge who your friends were and who the important people in this chapter of your life were and to say goodbye to them, not forever. It can be, see you later or see you soon. But to acknowledge that these people were important to you and you are now moving on to a different chapter of your life, but to, you know, close that chapter properly and have um, a sense of conclusion. Because otherwise it just, it gets in your head and, and you close yourself off and you just keep going to the next place and the next place and the next place and you never process. And this can sort of compound into grief, unresolved grief. You know, you leave your best friends behind, but you never give yourself time to grieve um, that you've said goodbye to someone important. Um, something a little more practical, you know, school can think about building a transition program. You can have a buddy system where incoming students get a buddy, you know, someone who shows them around for the first couple of weeks and this can then start friendships. Uh, you can make a handbook. My a school that I worked in in London, international school, they, they had a really good transition program. We had a handbook that all the incoming students would get, which told them how to get around the new school, what the rules were, um, how to behave, you know, stuff with the uniform, timetables, um, etiquette, everything, so that they don't have to kind of try to figure these things out. Um, and you can even go as far as having individual counseling sessions to help kids transition into a new school and transition out of the school when they are leaving. And overall, any classroom activities that recognize the third culture kid identity. Uh, I, in my teaching, I, I make it explicit and I, I always start out by telling kids that this is what I am. I'm a third culture kid because they always ask me, where are you from? And I never tell them. And then finally, I, I, you know, I just say, I am this, I'm a third culture kid. And it's amazing. Every time I do this, a lot of kids will go, oh, I am that too. And, you know, they feel so included suddenly where they may, may have been shy or they may not have been able to, to speak about who they are. A lot of them go, oh yeah, well, I'm a third culture kid too. And it just creates this um, transparent, open atmosphere in the classroom. And um, this was an activity that I did recently, which you can adapt to, you know, whatever you're teaching. But uh, I had them do a mind map where we were studying uh, photography and culture. And so we had to kind of talk about what culture is and what it means. So I had them do a mind map of their culture. What, what, what is your culture? What is your identity? Um, so I had them think about all the places that are meaningful to you, make a mind map of all the things you remember from those places. Um, and they all did very different mind maps um, and then they got to share them with each other and it helped them to see each other a little bit better for who they are, you know? And, and teenagers love opportunities to share things about themselves in this way. So oh sorry, I moved on from that. Well we can come back to this at the end if anyone has any questions. Um, but I'm gonna move on because I just looking at the time. So diploma program, these diploma program if you're not in IB school is the last two years of, of high school before uh, kids go to university. And then the university transition, which is super important. Um, the staff responsible for, for university counseling, if, if there is such a thing at your school, uh, you should strive to understand the different places that students are going to for university. If you've got kids going um, to Australia uh, or to the UK or to the US, try to, try to understand yourself, you know, what, what kind of universities, what's the university culture in these places to better help them understand the kind of place they're going to if it's not their, their home country. Another good way to help older kids transition, um, and a lot of schools do this, invite alumni to come and give talks, or if that's not feasible, 
get teachers to have a session with the students to talk about their university experiences, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, just to help them prepare for what they're getting into. Another good idea would be to create a Facebook group of recent alumni plus the graduating class so that they can talk to each other. Those who have just graduated one year or two years ago um, can get in touch with the ones who are graduating now to find out well, where did they go to university? How's it going? Well, what should I expect? Um, generally try to have frank conversations about students' expectations and worries. Help them to understand the importance of a support network. They might be like myself and thinking, yeah, charging ahead into this new world. Yeah, I can do it. Um, they're gonna need a support network when they get out there into the, the big wide world. Um, one piece of advice that I would give always in universities is emphasize the value of international clubs and societies in these in universities, because they're likely to find friends there um, with a similar mindset and generally prepare them to leave the bubble. They don't realize the kind of bubble that they're in in international schools until they get out into the real world. Um, and overall, work on reflection and self-awareness so that they can continue to you know, think about who they are as they evolve into adults. Okay, we can do this if you want. Um, how can you, do you have any thoughts about how you can identify and support the third culture kids in your school? Excellent time management, Magdalena. We still have around 15 minutes for the people who are asking about the slides. The whole session is recorded and then you can watch it again and again on the YouTube channel. I just shared it via the chat. And let's hear from your experience. How can you identify and support the third culture kid in your school? Uh, so waiting to hear from you and checking your ideas because I'm sure we're going to learn uh, from each other and uh, we are going to um, exchange ideas together. Remember in that chat, put all panelists and attendees so everyone can uh, read the, the chat and the um, ideas you are sharing. And then Magdalena, um, uh, we can also later on have a look at the questions. We have some questions in the Q&A so we can check this. Uh, waiting for some responses from our attendees this afternoon. They are a little bit quiet, but... Uh... Yeah, sorry I went through this so quickly. I just suddenly thought, oh, there's a lot here to talk about, a lot to unpack, and I could talk for hours. Mm. Uh, so Tabitha is saying, I have found following Graft for helping children transition out to be very helpful. Um, can you explain a little bit more about uh, the raft? Because I know I use the word raft for a different maybe uh, uh, experience. Is it the role audience format and topic, the strategy, or is it something else? And then more questions are coming in the Q&A. So this is good. Okay, uh, ah, so the raft here has a different meaning, R, reconciliation, A, affirmation, F, farewell, and T, thinking destination. I'm not sure if Magdalena, you, you, you have been again through this strategy or you've heard about it. No, but it sounds good. Yeah, so R, reconciliation, A, affirmation, F, farewell, and T, thinking destination. So this is one idea from Tabitha. Thank you for sharing it with us. Good, so what's next? Did we reach the Q&A? Yes, yeah. so Q&A. Magdalena, we are going to stop sharing the screen now. Uh, and then you can have a look at the Q&A for a, for a moment while I'm sharing. So you can just read them before I start asking them. Um, I'm going to share with you again, everyone. This is our website. So you've been here to register for this session. You can continue watching the following session. We have a session on creating smooth transition for students with special education need in approximately half an hour from now. And then we are going to talk about the universal design for learning as an approach. 
uh, for inclusive practice. And then we will finish the day for a session for you and for your own support to support your well being. We will have a mindfulness session and we will do a mindfulness uh, practice online uh, via our platform. And this is the YouTube channel that I mentioned where all the recording of our previous webinar and the webinars of today will be available for you. Some of them are in English, in French, and in Arabic. So, Magdalena, are you ready for the Q&A? Yeah? I am. Yeah. So let's start. So uh, uh, Sarwa is asking, what can we do as parents for third culture kids to help them? Okay. So if you are a mother or, or a father of a third culture kid, how can we support them? What do we need to do? Well, I think the most important thing to do is to make sure you educate yourself, especially if you yourselves are not third culture kids, but your kids are. Um, educate yourself on, on what it is, um, and, and the different problems that can arise. And I can suggest uh, some amazing resources that are good for parents as well as teachers that really helped me as an adult because my my parents weren't super aware of, of third culture kid they were just like yeah we're going we're doing this and they did their best but i found as a as an adult in my 20s that i was really struggling with what had happened in my life and the friends that i had lost and, and all the transitions i had had so I went out and, and I got some books and I did a lot of reading and processing. And so I think for parents, there's, there's a ton of resources and I can suggest um, one book that is really worth getting. Um, I don't know, maybe after I can, I can type the title. Yeah, in. they can email you or you can put ah, it in yeah. the chat. So if yeah. you put this in the chat. You just talked about friendship and then Arlene is asking, is it really difficult to build long lasting friendship for a third culture kid? Okay, I'm going to say yes and no. <laughs> and it really depends, first of all, what kind of person you are. Um, but also, long lasting friendships, it depends how often you've moved. What I have found for myself, because I moved a lot as a child, and then also my friends moved. So I lost friends, even if I'd stayed in a school for a long time, my friends left. And, and so, for a lot of us, people who stay in the same environment for a long time and spend their childhood in one place, they tend to have those long lasting friendships that go into adulthood. Um, I never had that and I always felt a little envious of, of the friends that I had who grew up in, in the same town and who had these long lasting friendships. Um, my oldest friends are friends that I made in middle school that and we're still friends today, but nothing like childhood friends that I had, they're not my friends anymore because we just grew apart. Um, but having said that, you know, the kind of friendships that you have with a TCK, if you make really good friends, then you can go for years without talking to those friends. But when you meet up again, uh, it's like no time has passed. And I think that goes for, for a lot of strong friendships, whether you're a TCK or not. Um, so it really, it really does depend, but it is harder for third culture kids. Just because of the mobility. Okay, and then I'm going to take now the final, oh, I have more questions coming. Uh, so um, do you think that third culture kid is a better definition than transnational and why? A better definition, third culture mm. versus transnational. I'm not sure what the difference is. Mm. Do you, Ali? No. Transnational. Like so okay maybe more explanation from tabitha uh, helen is asking after research for a dissertation i discovered that there is a possible link with being a third culture kid and delayed adolescence do you think this is plausible mm -hmm. delayed adolescence um well if they did a, a if they research yes. research for dissertation oh that there is a possible link being a TCK and delayed adolescence. Well, I myself am not, not a psychologist and I, I don't have much experience in, in I, to under, understanding these things in detail, but I, I would say that it could be plausible. Um, but it really would depend on the child's situation, how often they've been moving and how, you know, what kind of support system they've had at home. 
because it okay. could create if, if they're not aware and if they're not given guidance and support at home and at school and they're just kind of thrown into these i'm going to use the word traumatic i know it's, it's a strong word but it can create these little traumas when when you don't mindfully um, navigate from one culture to the next and, and your life is you can get stuck in kind of survival mode um, and when you're in survival mode you're not you're not growing as an individual you're surviving and so that could be a link good so i know you are a teacher magdalena you are a third culture kid and so let me finish that discussion with this question what do you suggest to teacher who have a third culture student when understanding the language is a challenge when their language so, is a challenge so when the yeah so like they don't speak the language of instruction yeah um be patient and supportive and kind and don't treat them like they're not as smart as the other kids they just because they cannot communicate they're going to feel slightly maybe inferior or frustrated with being unable to communicate give them all the support and patience that you can muster and give them ways and opportunities to communicate through visuals through gestures give them as much as you can in terms of vocabulary to help them slowly get to that point where they can use language to communicate but yeah i would say patience and kindness okay and so it's time to say goodbye <laughs> right. and then uh, hopefully we will have another moment to chat and to explore this topic together uh, so a very short break and then we will be talking about how to ensure we have nice transition for our students with special education needs and uh, i'm sure again many of you will be attending the following session thanks again magdalena for sharing okay. your story for sharing the tips and for sharing uh, who you are today with us uh, via this uh, webinar. My um, pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.